So I am today's speaker um, and just a little bit about me. So why I'm here, um, why I am qualified to talk to you guys about AI and manufacturing uh, specific to content marketing and sales. I am COO and partner at Protocol 80. I started here six and a half years ago as a content writing intern. Donnie mentioned this a little bit in his intro, but we are an agency that specializes in doing inbound marketing for manufacturing companies. So the lens at which I look at digital marketing is always around industrial niche B2B manufacturing. Um, I wrote a book last fall called Inbound Immortal that is on Amazon, and that is a deep dive into all things inbound marketing. Um, and the reason why I wrote this book was because I had felt like a lot of the resources, the webinars, the books, the courses that were out there um, always talked so theoretically about how to do inbound, but never actually gave you a guide on how to sit down and physically do it. So I wanted to give a guide that I felt confident if one of our clients didn't work with us, they could read this book and accomplish the same type of things. Um, so that is there if you are new to inbound or just interested in brushing up on your skills. A little bit of a shameless plug, but I do genuinely think it's a helpful resource for those uh, doing manufacturing marketing. Um, a little bit of the fun stuff about me. I have two cats, um, Wilson and Wasabi. My favorite band is Mount Joy. And my favorite food of all time is soft pretzels. And if somebody was to walk through the office today with soft pretzels, I would totally abandon this session entirely in uh, favor of the soft pretzels. If you have any questions or anything like that throughout, you can absolutely um, drop it in the chat. I think there's also a Q&A section here. So feel free and then I will check that periodically and we can also have a Q&A session at the end. There's only a few of us today on this virtual session. So I figure we could be collaborative and go back and forth and swap some ideas and tips and tricks about AI or marketing towards the end if that seems helpful for you guys. Okay, so here's our agenda. We just did the intros. We're gonna spend some time talking about AI for marketing, AI for sales, and then as I mentioned, we'll have time for some Q&A and uh, to chat with one another. Candidly, the leader of the contract manufacturing HubSpot user group is my colleague, Josh Curcio. He was asked to speak at an AI summit in New York City today. So that is where he is. He is our absolute HubSpot guru, expert, champion. He knows HubSpot in, out, left, right. Um, and so if you guys have any questions uh, pertaining to HubSpot or anything on the sales side that I can't answer, I will make sure to intro you to him and he would be more than happy to do a one-on-one -on -one call and walk you through anything uh, here today that I might not be able to. Um, but we do wish we could clone him and have him in two places at once for all of his wonderful HubSpot knowledge. Okay, so getting into AI for marketing, I have to start with some disclaimers. Um, I always like to do this when I talk about AI because I think these are really important. So I am a marketer, not a data scientist, not a computer scientist. So the things that I talk about as it pertains to AI is through the lens of marketing. I don't know how to code an AI. I don't know how to do any of that really fancy stuff. So I will be speaking about things um, as it pertains to marketing and to our clients. Information on AI is changing literally daily. I did go in this morning and add some things to this slide deck that were pertinent to some new use cases and some changes. So it's really important to note that as we're sitting here right now, <laughs> OpenAI ChatGPT could be launching something that completely makes all of this obsolete. But I believe there's a lot of really strong info in here that could be helpful and evergreen. Everything in this presentation is my opinion. Again, there are lots of tactical tips in here that are taken from the PAD team as a whole that are taken from other um, AI experts in the marketing space. But generally, AI is so new that we're all kind of forming best practices together in live time. So if there's something that's working for you that's not here, or if you disagree with anything I've presented, I think that that's awesome. Um, and I encourage you to challenge me during the Q&A portion or to share what is or isn't working for you because everything is just so new. Um, if anyone says they're an absolute expert, I would question that heavily. Um, and we're going to focus, as the title to this session alludes to, as it pertains to content marketing and the best practices that align with inbound marketing. Is the concept of inbound marketing brand new to anyone um, with us? You can use the raise hand function if so, and I'll give a little bit of background. Is that is the phrase inbound marketing um, a new one for anyone here? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to press forward. 
Um, that's good. So all of these tips are tailored towards inbound. So I think you guys will find them helpful if you're doing a little bit of inbound today. So I wanted to start with a glossary um, that is relevant to AI because a lot of these terms are thrown around. And um, at least I feel like when I first started learning about AI, these terms were everywhere and I didn't really have a true understanding of what they meant. So these are some of the terms I'll be using today. And I wanted to touch on them so that we were on the same page with everything. So of course, AI, artificial intelligence itself, is the field of computer science that empowers machines to emulate human learning, decision-making, and reasoning. This is achieved through advanced algorithms and electronic circuitry. An algorithm is a precise step-by-step -step instruction or rule that a computer software or other technology follows to solve a problem or perform a task. So we are familiar with algorithms, not only in the AI space, but also as digital marketers, you know, when Google or a social media platform changes its algorithm, changes the rules that we all play by, it throws us marketers into a tailspin trying to learn what those rules are and how to curve our marketing appropriately. Generative AI is a unique kind of AI that creates new content on its own without needing explicit human instructions, and it has a focus on creativity. Generative AI is predominantly what we'll be talking about today. We will also dive into some of the AI HubSpot tools um, that are focused on efficiency, but really generative AI and content marketing is what we're going to dive deep into. ChatGPT is just a language model-based AI, specifically a chatbot. GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, which is just the architecture that it uses to learn. And the function of ChatGPT is to model text-based responses that mimic natural language. Machine learning is the way computers learn from data and make decisions without being explicitly told what to do. And deep learning is a type of machine learning where artificial neural networks with many layers are used to automatically find patterns and info within data. This is great for tasks like recognizing images, understanding speech, and working with language. So that machine learning and deep learning is important because as we talk about, as we talk through this, I'm going to touch on the concept that ChatGPT, other um, open AI platforms learn from what you're putting into it. So that is how they do that. And that is what that means. Okay, so just some additional parameters for today. Um, these are aimed at being high level and accessible on free tools like ChatGPT. At the end, I will also, uh, there is a slide that includes some sales tools that integrate really nicely with HubSpot as well. Um, these are focused on content efficiencies and AI is around us all the time and we don't even know it. So basically this whole slide is just saying, we are going to touch the very tip of the iceberg and I'm trying, I'm going to try to arm you with as much practical knowledge as possible. So you can walk out of here with some tips and tricks, but it certainly is something that we could talk about for days. Um, so something that we've heard a lot, especially when chat GPT generative AI was becoming extremely popular was that AI was totally going to replace content writers. Um, you know, what's the point of having people sit and write blogs when AI could just do it for us? Like content writers, you should be scared about your jobs. Um, I'm here to say that that is wrong, <laughs> that content writers should not be afraid. Marketers should not be afraid. And why do I think that? So here we have some quotes pulled together from um, marketing influencers in the space who you guys may or may not be familiar with. Over the summer, Protocol 80, our entire team attended, um, I think, 12 weeks worth of sessions by these leading AI thinkers. Um, and here are some of the highlights from other people in the space that I really liked and some analogies to explain AI, generative AI, how it works, how we should view it, and why it's not like a person. So Ann Hanley of Marketing Profs says generative AI is like a microwave, so it can reheat something that you've created, but it cannot create something completely from scratch um, like a chef could. A librarian who has read every book and memorized it, you'll hear me harken back to this quote from Will Reynolds a little bit um, because this is a really important one, and I think this resonates and explains a lot about how ChatGPT works and where its limitations are a wing person to help with brainstorming and ideation, a utility player to make technical edits and accomplish menial tasks, and a fairy godmother to simplify complex research and help generate subject lines. So all of these different things that ChatGPT is like, um, but at the end of the day, ChatGPT cannot effectively be a person. And also I tried to pull some emojis at the bottom that were relevant to the slide and there's no microwave emoji. And it's kind of crazy to be here talking about, you know, all of this awesome, miraculous generative AI technology, but not even have a microwave emoji. Okay, so here's a little bit more on why generative AI is not like a content marketer. One of the most important ones, you'll see I have this as the top bullet and then again highlighted a couple points later, 
is that um, it does not have to give you accurate information. So this is a lot more commonplace now than when I first started uh, talking about AI and giving this presentation, but ChatGPT has been shown time and time again, along with other generative AI out there like Bard, that if you ask it the exact same question, a fact-based question, something that should be very simple, um, AI does not give you the same answer 100% of the time and that, and that answer is not always accurate. So that's huge, right? If we're asking AI to create something from scratch, to write something for us, for our brand, it's really important that that information is accurate if we're going to publish it. So this is a huge one. And every single day, AI is getting better at this. Open AI um, is talking, especially recently, about the changes that they're making to make things more and more accurate. But that guarantee is still not 100%. And I think we're still pretty far away from a world where it would be 100%. Uh, generative AI cannot think, be creative, present new ideas. So this is a very um, kind of a vague sentence. But what I mean by that is like we talked about earlier, AI is like a librarian that's read every book in the library. At this point in time, interfacing with functions like ChatGPT is not going to be able to present brand new ideas, brand new theories in the um, engineering space, in the manufacturing space. You guys are constantly finding new ways to make things better for your clients. Uh, AI can't do that. They can't figure out how to solve problems and you know bring new things to light. It does not understand nuances and slang. It does not and cannot cite sources accurately. So you can ask ChatGPT, hey, where did you pull this information from? But as with the giving accurate information, this has been tested time and time again to know that that's incomplete or sometimes ChatGPT will cite a source that clearly was not used in what it created. And this is a little bit like an analogy I think makes sense here is if it's a librarian that's read every book in the library, it's really hard for ChatGPT to think of and provide to you exactly where it got that idea. It would be like me asking you the first time you learned what an apple was. You can't cite that specific book. You've just remembered you've known what an apple is for as long as you've known. So that is um, really important as well, especially as we get into technical writing, academic writing, being able to cite sources um, is huge. Um, it cannot perform well with complex subject matter. We will dive deeper into this in a little bit. And it's kind of a nothing burger. So um, one of our senior content writers, Adam Vossler, this is his analogy where when he has been experimenting with generating content with AI, he explains it like there's a ton of bun and lettuce and all of this fluff on the burger, but the actual meat, the part of the blog that your persona, the people you're trying to write to would care about is this really thin little patty with not a lot of meat to it, leading to an unsatisfying experience overall. So uh, it generates a lot for you, but not a lot that's good. But obviously there are a lot of helpful use cases still specifically in B2B spaces. Um, so here are some spaces where AI can help. Um, so these are right the way that the PAD team uses AI, um, some ways that we interface with it. So analyzing chunks of text that you input for meaning, context, missing info, and more. Um, I'm going to, there's an asterisk on point three here, but I'm going to also just touch on that right now. So again, it's really important to remember that not everything ChatGPT gives you or um, pulls for you is 100% accurate. So these are kind of general. When you are working with something for the first time, if you have a really complex piece of engineering documentation that you want to turn into a piece of marketing copy, and you're looking at it like, oh my goodness, this is basically a foreign language to me. I don't even know where to begin. Inputting something like that and asking ChatGPT to interpret it for you, to give you a starting point for your research, for your writing can be really helpful. Additionally, analyzing for tone and things like that. An example I always like to give is sometimes I come off kind of passive aggressive in my emails and my communication. So when I'm sending an email to a client or to a team member, I really like to take that and put it into ChatGPT first and say, okay, how am I coming off here? And ChatGPT might tell you, you know, this is a little aggressive. We might want to tone it down and then asking ChatGPT to tone it down for me. That can be incredibly helpful. Helping you create derivative works of your own works. So an example of this that I did was, as I mentioned earlier, I wrote a book that was entirely mine. Um, taking chapters of that book and asking ChatGPT to put that into blog post form that we could share on the PAD website. And then, of course, having to edit what it creates and that sort of thing. But creating derivative works of my own work that I know is accurate because I wrote it. 
a brainstorm and research assistant. So again, this has an asterisk here because you don't want to take the information that ChatGPT gives you and just run with it without verifying anything. But it can be a really great way to pull together a lot of different resources and get you started. Rephrasing or rewriting your work to accomplish a goal, proofreading your work in a specific style, short form text generation like meta descriptions or email subject lines, those things that us as marketers just toil over and toil over, specifically when there's character limits or word count limits and you're like, oh my gosh, I know what I want to say here, but I have no idea how I'm going to fit it into 30 characters. That can be a really great use. Um, image and program generation as an iterative work. So again, if you have multiple images or graphics and saying, okay, I want to make this into one big PDF utilizing what I have here. And then also simple image and graphic generation. So, you know, I need a picture of three trees together. You're not asking it to create something incredibly complicated. You're not asking it to create a work of art. You're just asking it to generate something that's incredibly simple. So those are some spaces where AI can be really helpful. So when we talk about AI, like we said earlier, there's, you know, the fairy godmother, there's the research assistant, there's the writing assistant. So talking extremely generally here to use this amazing graphic by Christopher Penn, um, we have the two main functions of something like ChatGPT being writing and generation and editing and comparison. And then we have, again, extremely broadly and generally the two different types of content that we're trying to produce or work with being commodity and generic or creative and expert, right? So those are our axes here um, for this graphic. So what this really accurately illustrates is what the Protocol 80 team has found when working with AI and doing all sorts of different tests to see what's efficient, what's not efficient, what's ethical, what's not ethical, what's accurate, what's not accurate. Um, these are the, this is extremely aligned with the things that we've found. So when it comes to writing and generation, if you're in the commodity or generic space, it's okay at creating content out of thin air for you. It's generally pretty accurate. It's generally pretty, um, you know, decent to read. It's important here to note that there are conversations about ethics and um, plagiarism and things like that we'll get into later on. But if we're just talking about the sheer output of it, it can be decent. So if I am someone who is selling toothpaste, and I want AI to write me a blog about the five top benefits of toothpaste, what I'm gonna get back is gonna be decent. It's still gonna be a little bit of a nothing burger. There's probably going to be a lot of stuff there that we just don't need. It might be lacking some of that expert opinion. If I'm a dentist, I might have to fact correct some of the things, but what it spits out is generally something that I can work with. When we move into the creative expert space as manufacturers, this is where all of you live, and you're asking ChatGPT to come up with something from absolute scratch, it doesn't do so well if it's able to do anything at all. Because if we think about ChatGPT for what it is as this supercomputer that has read all of the resources out there in the world, World and is modeling a human response to that. As a manufacturer in this niche space, you have solutions to problems that should be and are very specific to your company. So ChatGPT doesn't know about that. Also, even if it's a general topic, like what are the benefits of aluminum versus stainless steel for a certain application, there's less resources about that out there than there are about toothpaste. So what you're getting when you're generating content that is more niche or technical is inherently less valuable and less easy to work with than what you might be getting from, um, you know, more of a commodity or generic space. Moving into editing and comparison. So this being like, you know, can you rephrase this? Can you write me an intro? That kind of thing. Um, shorter things, writing, summarizing, uh, those more menial tasks. If you're working in the commodity and generic space, perfect. This is a perfect use for AI. Um, there's probably very little issue that you're going to run into that would be an extremely efficient process. When you get into the creative and expert space, also a great use, you're going to be able to find some efficiencies, but there are going to be areas that just are not as easy for you as others. So if you're trying to write a very technical piece of content that an engineer can read, and you maybe produced a blog and you're asking ChatGPT to edit it and make it more conversational, they might fail at that more than they would fail at doing something in the generic space. So this just basically shows um, the effort and impact and results of using AI in different spaces.
So how do you do it? So let's talk a little bit about actually using something like ChatGPT to create um, something or to do those use cases. So the act of putting something into ChatGPT in order to get an output is called prompt generation. And if you put prompt generation into Google and Google different prompts that marketers are using, there are a billion different examples of effective prompts and how to do it. So this is really just an overview of prompts and prompts generation for you guys, but this is certainly a whole land to continue to explore. Um, so all prompt generation is, is creating a specific input that serves as an instruction or question to guide it to your desired response or output. Um, putting context in and um, adding as much detail as you can makes your responses better. So there's a threshold there of um, wanting to put enough information into the chatbot to make it give you helpful output without spending so much time training the chatbot that, chat bot that you could have just done the thing yourself. So finding that threshold with prompt generation is really important, but generally the more information, the more context you're able to give the chatbot, the better the output is going to be. So breaking down prompt generation and prompts into five really simple categories, um, you have simple commands, partner prompts, text analysis, text revision, and derivative work generation. So, so these are probably some of the five most common prompts you might be using interfacing with ChatGPT. So telling the AI to do something specific. So write me an email to my boss that tells them I'm going to be taking PTO. This can sound a little silly, some of these examples of simple commands, but I hope I'm not alone when I know that creating communication like that in my workday sometimes is where I burn time, um, even though it's not impactful or effective. I want to make sure my tone is right. Should I put an exclamation point there? Should I not put an exclamation point there? So some of those simple commands can be really, really time saving um, over time as it adds up. Partner prompts, so when you want to go back and forth a little bit and use AI as a brainstorm assistant, so suggest five ideas for a blog post about stainless steel and marine applications that's unique. So again, you might not want to necessarily take all of the ideas and um, you know just roll with them without any additional research or effort, but that can be a really good place to start if you're stuck. Text analysis, so providing copy for the AI to look at and respond to. We've talked about that in abundance. Um, text revision, so read this copy, rewrite it in AP style, read this copy, write it like a press release, that kind of thing. And derivative work generation, so you provide copy and the AI gives you copy back. Really great example of this might be you created a blog, you input that blog copy to the AI and you say, I would like you to write free LinkedIn posts based on this blog. Super easy, super efficient. So um, here are some phrases and things you can tell chat GPT that may help you avoid some frustration and get better results. Um, because as you'll realize, chat GPT, that nothing burger comparison, if you haven't already been using it, will ring very true. Chat GPT loves to put in a lot of adjectives and loves to give a lot of fluff. So these are some ways where you can get around that, including this in your prompt. Um, initially or as you continue to work through whatever you're working with the GPT on. So something um, that can be helpful is if you're trying to think of something that's outside of the box or doing something incredibly unique, saying, I want you to pull me five ideas for a marketing campaign to promote this product that is not an adherence with understood best practice. This avoids um, getting five answers about how to promote something that you already know, that everybody knows, because it's the most basic way to promote something in the world. That might help you get a little bit more creative responses. Um, in adherence with understood best practice, that can also be really helpful if you're researching a topic and you just want to know, okay, how is everybody else doing this? I don't really want something creative. I'm not trying to get out of the box. I'm just trying to perform something that a million people have performed before and I want to understand how it's done. Give me the stuff that is understood to be best practice without unnecessary adjectives. This is something I put into almost every single one of my chat GPT prompts because I cannot stand it when I get something back from chat GPT and every other word is an adjective that nobody uses in real life. That one is huge. huge. Also revise for clarity. Um, I can be very wordy when I type things. I'm sure you can tell by the fact that my slides read like a literal book. I, I'm a very wordy person. So asking ChatGPT to revise my things for clarity, it's amazing how it will take something that I've explained in 500 words and synthesize it down to you know, 200 words. That's way better. 
um, using only what I've provided here. This is very huge, especially as we get into some conversations about plagiarism and ethics um, as it pertains to this. If you're trying to create new content, if you want to be very sure that what you're creating um, is truly a derivative work, it's based off of what you've inputted, um, like the social media post example, or like the generating blogs from my book example, you can tell ChatGPT to use only what I've provided here. Like, do not scrape the internet, do not use your resources, just rephrase what I've given you. Obviously, the caveat there is there's a little bit of general knowledge that GPT has to have in order to even respond to that, just like a person, but it won't introduce a new idea or a new concept entirely that's not there. Also modeling off of these samples, that can be a really good example. I was recently writing a bunch of product descriptions for the Protocol 80 website, and um, I needed to do like 70 total. So I wrote a couple that were from me in my writing what I wanted, and I was able to give it examples um, to do that repetition and model it in a way that sounded like me, that sounded like what I wanted. So if you already have examples of social media posts or blog posts or things like that, that you might want to riff off of with ChatGPT, providing those examples and asking them to adhere to that can be helpful. Also in the style of XYZ. So if you have like a brand voice that you really like, if you want something to be very formal, you can just ask ChatGPT to give you the response in the style of whatever it is that makes the most sense. So hopefully these, um, using these here and there may help you save some time that we've burned trying to figure out how to make ChatGPT not make us wanna rip our hair out. Okay, so here are um, even more use cases for uh, AI. So my slide's covering a little bit here. Sorry about that. But so helping us translate complex technical documents into readable English. So that's a really good one. Generating a fleet of social media posts across multiple platforms based on content. Suggesting topic ideas to look into for content. Punching up copy. Um, generating smaller works. Constant grammar and syntax assistance. So making sure before you put something out there that it is grammatically correct. Um, generating fluff text, like intros and conclusions. Um, when I was a writer, I know one of the things that I'd always like to adhere to was start in the middle. Sometimes writing those intros and those conclusions are uh, where you toil the most and burn the most time just trying to think of ways um, to say something. So some fluff text like that can get you started. I will also say when it comes to generation like that, what I've found helpful is if I'm really stuck and I know I don't want to take what chat, chat GPT gives me and just copy and paste it somewhere. Sometimes I like to see how they write something because editing is sometimes easier than writing something on my own. So if chat GPT writes an intro for a blog for me that I think is total crap, then I can look at that and say, oh my God, I would never do it like that. I would do it like this. And all of a sudden I've written my own thing just because I wanted to prove chat GPT wrong and show it that I can do better. So that is also kind of a way to just get you unstuck with certain things. Um, generating PPC ad headlines based on human written copy. Anyone who has set up um, ad campaigns with multiple ad groups knows that there are descriptions and headlines and tags and things like that that have very specific um, text limits in that you need to generate like a million different versions of. Um, like I mentioned earlier, generating a couple that are by you that you really like and then having ChatGPT generate all of the different iterations that you're going to use to test with can be really helpful. Same could be true about A-B testing and something like email subject lines. Um, turning text chunks into visuals like charts to add to copy. So if you want to break something up, you're writing a comparison blog about materials, um, asking ChatGPT to like format that into a nice table for you can save time brainstorming campaign ideas that are creative. So again, that kind of goes back to earlier with asking it to come up with something that maybe has uh, never been done before in this way or, um, you know, breaks best practice just to get you out of a rut. Analyzing competitor sites to scan for content opportunities. So putting in URLs into GPT, this is not available on the free version, but is on the paid version and saying, um, you know, what are the gaps here? What could I talk about that this URL isn't talking about? Forecasting support for marketing effort performance. So if you know what your close rate is, if you know what your traffic is, if you know what your MQL to SQL rate is, you can put all of that data into ChatGPT and say, okay, if I was to launch a pillar um, and I'm expecting it to yield, you know, 10,000 visits in the first quarter to my website, what percent of those are going to become customers so that you can start to gauge based on real data what things will look like. 
um, and roadmap creation for complex long-term initiatives. So let's say you have a really good idea. You're like, okay, we're attending a trade show in the fall. We know we want to do this giveaway lay out for me an agenda of how to get there. And you can get specific. You can say, I have three people on my marketing team who can give five hours a week to this initiative. What are the steps we should take to make sure this gets off the ground? That can be really helpful as well. So my little pop-up here notes that the common denominator in all of these is a human providing source text or providing context so that what you're getting back is unique ideas. None of this is asking AI to just generate a blog post for you and then taking that and copy and pasting that onto your website. Okay, some ethical considerations. Um, Really important here, as I started at the top, not a lawyer, not a data scientist, none of that. So this is not legal advice. It's important um, when you are going to start to use things like AI to check with the legal team at your company. Make sure that you are all aligned on how you want to move forward with these things. Um, but this is some general advice and things that I think you should keep in mind as you move forward using AI. So public AI, free chat GPT, other public AI can use and is probably using the stuff that you put into it to make it smarter. So allegedly you are able to, in your settings, turn that off so that ChatGPT does not take your things and learn from you. But I would encourage you to um, take this information extremely cautiously. Meaning if you are launching a new product, a new application, a new material, something like that, I would keep proprietary info that you wouldn't want a competitor to read out of AI as much as possible to be 100% safe. Of course, as always, don't put any personal information into AI, all of that stuff. But also, I tend to lean on the side of an abundance of caution with stuff like this and would recommend just keeping anything that you wouldn't want your competitors to read out of AI so that it can't use it to train its models and use that information to spit back to someone else. Part of that would be looking into ChatGPT for Teams. So this is a relatively new feature where you can um, have a collaborative workspace within ChatGPT. It is paid um, and that is, again, allegedly private. They don't use it to train their models. But um, just keeping that in mind, that can help improve efficiency if you want to build information on your persona right in there um, to help generate social posts or things like that um, can help keep everything in one place for your team. Legislation is coming out constantly about AI and generative AI use. It's important to keep a really close eye on this. Um, AI generated content cannot be copyright protected and the rules around this are super duper unclear. So what we don't know at this point in time is like what percent of AI generated thing can be copyright protected, what can't, what is considered AI generated content. If I write 50% of a blog and AI writes 50% of a blog, is that human generated or AI generated? This is still super unclear and hairy. So it's just important to keep that in mind as you're producing things. Plagiarism is a real thing. ChatGPT doesn't care about it, but you should. There's nothing stopping ChatGPT from, um, if you ask it to generate a blog for you, from going to someone else's website and plagiarizing something and spitting it back out to you. I will say there's not a ton of evidence that ChatGPT is literally doing that. For the most part, they are creating unique things. But when you're writing things for your business, you want to err on the side of caution always. So I would recommend strongly, strongly, strongly against ever taking long form pieces of content from ChatGPT that you've had them generate out of thin air and copy and pasting that into something for your brand. I think it's incredibly risky, especially think, since you don't know what is true, what's not true, where it came from. It's just risky. I would recommend against using it in that way. AI has proven discriminative bias. So like we talked about earlier, AI has taken an amalgamation of everything that humans have done online. So blog posts, resources, ebooks, Reddit, Twitter, all of that. So all of the biases and yuckiness that human beings have, AI now has as well. I always like to mention this because I think there is a sense sometimes that AI is better than humans. Um, and what you're going to get out of it is almost more pure because it's done by a robot and not a human. And this isn't true. It's been trained on us. So it has some of the same fallacies that we do. And I'm sure you've picked up on this theme by now, but I recommend strongly against using AI to generate full long form content out of thin air and using that. But if that is something that you would like to do that you're going to employ as a part of your strategy, it's really important to find a way to fact check and plagiarism check that piece of work to cover your butt um, and your company's butt so that you are not publishing and promoting things that are ethically a little bit hairy. 
So what are some next steps now that we've, um, you know, talked about this? So putting this into practice, so talking to the powers that be at your company about the comfort level with AI use, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what tools you're going to use, what you're comfortable with, beginning to build a prompt library to help you and your team members save time. Um, so this can be incredibly helpful if you've found that there's a really useful way to generate email subject lines. You put in information about your persona. It's been generating some information that works really, really well. Um, make sure you're documenting that somewhere so that other marketers on your team can collaborate and use those same prompts too. Utilizing AI's tools that help you and don't just clunk up your process. So something I have seen people fall into is, again, the idea that, oh, if I go into chat GPT and I do this task in chat, it's going to be more efficient. That's not necessarily true if you're finding yourself needing to train the model and go back and forth so much when you could have just written the thing in the first place. So just being cognizant of the time taken using ChatGPT versus doing it on your own. Testing, failing, trying again, saving time, starting to master it. So really just experimenting with what works best for you and your team. And then maybe trying out some of the prompt ideas and, and tips and tricks here. We've found a lot of these things to be really efficient for our team. And maybe there are some things in there that you might find efficient as well. OK, so we are going to pivot into talking about AI for sales and um, as well as AI in HubSpot, some of the features that are there in upcoming. Before we pivot to this portion of the presentation, does anybody have any questions on the AI and marketing stuff we just chatted about? I do see I have a chat notification, but that might be old. Um, OK. Awesome. Let's get into it. Oh, I was clicking on the wrong screen here. OK, so we're going to talk about why using AI for sales, AI general tools, HubSpot tools, some cautions and Q&A. Um, so this is a little bit of a recap of what we just talked about. But in specific to a sales lens, some things that robots do better than people would be follow up, efficiency, reporting and data mining. Uh, they don't have the fear of rejection. They can take notes better. They work 24 seven, 365 and they're cheaper. So when there are things that are very menial and very efficiency based and very specific from a time perspective that you want to have accomplished, it's better to automate that, have AI do that, have AI involved somehow to help get those things done so that you are being as efficient as you possibly can be while keeping in mind that the things that people do better are empathy, strategy and creativity, situational understanding and rapport. So it's really important that we don't just create a billion different touch points that we're sending out with no humans looking at it, set and forget it, especially in today's day and age, those things are just not going to hit. So making sure that you find the balance of human generated and driven um, touch points that are powered by AI and some tools like that to help you better maintain efficiency without losing that empathy. Um, so again, AI can't take the place of salespeople, but it can be a very good tool in their tool belt, just like how we think about it on the marketing side. So here are some examples using ChatGPT of how our sales team, how Josh is using um, ChatGPT to help make him more efficient. Um, so taking notes on calls, having ChatGPT organize that for you in a way that can either be put into your CRM or shared in a recap with the client or shared with other members of your team can be really helpful. Um, ChatGPT is very smart. So even if your notes have some typos or have some formatting errors, taking it to ChatGPT and saying, okay, I have all of these loose ideas. Can you organize this for me in a way that makes sense? Can you organize this and put it into a recap email? That type of stuff can be incredibly helpful and help speed up your sales team time team's time without you know losing anything on the human side. Um, this is a, another one. Um, I really like this prompt that Josh has in here and uh, to help create an email that is effective. It's really tiny, so I'll read it to you. You are a salesperson for a contract manufacturing company. You will be in Jamestown, New York, visiting a client and have about three hours to spare. Write a cold email outreach to a similar company as your client, suggesting a brief meeting or lunch while you're in the area so that you can learn more about their business. Keep the email short and professional. Don't be wordy. 
Um, and then ChatGPT spit out an email here. I'm not going to read this to you because I'm sure that would be exceedingly boring. But um, again, you guys will have a copy of this. So if you want to reference these exact prompts and you know what the responses and stuff look like, you totally can. But um, ChatGPT basically, you know, just sums that up and put it into email form. And then Josh said, revise this to make it less formal um, because it is a little bit too formal for how Josh would talk. And ChatGPT did that and gave an amazing output that looks like it was written by Josh and um, can be sent right away. So this is an example of an email that he put in enough information that it could include that human touch in it and give a relevant response without sending forever, just typing up, overthinking his tone, like, okay, does that come across too friendly? Is it not friendly enough? Um, just a really efficient way to work with ChatGPT on the sales side. Um, another really important thing that you can use and should be using is Grammarly. Um, everyone on our team uses Grammarly and it's incredibly helpful for especially salespeople who are emailing all the time, all day, every day, um, making sure that your grammar is being checked and then also offering suggestions to punch up some of your writing. Grammarly is really great about saying, okay, you've used the word awesome six times in this email or this communication. Maybe we want to switch it up and say something different as well as of course, just, um, checking for your general tone, your um, spelling, your grammar, and that kind of thing. This can save time from going in and out of ChatGPT. Again, like we talked about on the marketing side, ChatGPT is really great for doing this type of thing as well. But installing something like Grammarly right onto your computer that is interfacing with everything that you're using, it's in HubSpot with you, it's in your email with you, it's, it's everywhere with you, um, can be really helpful and just improve your writing little by little so that by 3 p.m. when you're sending your 17th outreach email of the day, you don't accidentally have some typos in it. Okay, so on the HubSpot side of things, um, as I mentioned earlier, AI is around us all the time and has been around us. Um, for a while, especially in the HubSpot tools, a lot of things have been AI powered, but these specifically are more generative AI type of things that HubSpot has added to each of their hubs to make things a little bit more effective for you. And so hopefully you don't have to hop out of HubSpot all the time and hop into ChatGPT. So bringing some of those features right into the HubSpot tools. So on the marketing side, um, you've got the content assistant, which helps you on landing pages, social marketing emails, CTAs, and SMS. And if you haven't used this yet, it looks like a little lightning bolt when you're writing something that you can hover over and it will offer to help you in various ways, depending on what that um, specific item is. So for example, I was creating an email yesterday, wrote up this beautiful email, um, go to the settings to set a subject line. And my content assistant is like, hey, do you want me to suggest a subject line for you so you don't have to write one? And I said, yes, content assistant, I would love that. That would be great. And it wrote me a subject line that was fantastic. It captured the spirit of what was in the email. I didn't have to edit it at all. Um, and that was wonderful. So that type of content assistant help is across all of uh, you know those different elements of the marketing hub. Image generation is also in there. AI subject line generator, like we talked about, social post captions and blog post summaries into social. So we had talked about using ChatGPT to generate fleets of social media. You can also do that rate right in HubSpot um, in certain ways as well. In the sales hub side, you've got AI sales forecasting, predictive deal health scores, and then the content assistant in your Gmail, Outlook, and on mobile. So again, just helping you out if you're stuck on a sentence, not sure what to say next, you've got the content assistant there. Um, in the service hub, you've got the AI chatbots, the content assistant in your inbox, the content assistant in your knowledge base, as well as conversation summary. Um, on the CMS hub, you've got the AI website builder, content assistant for website pages and blogs, image generation, AI generated social copy, and AI blog title generator. Um, so this is everything that is currently in HubSpot right now that you can work with and using some of the tips and tricks from ChatGPT, but again, just natively working in the HubSpot platform. On the roadmap, so as of the latest roadmap that HubSpot has released, and I actually will drop the link to this as well, the website page and the roadmap so that you guys can read more. I will drop that in the chat um, in case anything catches your eye and you would like to investigate further. Okay, there we go. 
so this is what's upcoming. So um, AI assistant in text editors, content recommendation, image generation, um, content remix to ads and social copy, generating campaign and social copy, generating marketing and sales emails, AI assisted report creation, AI powered content ideas, and AI knowledge based article editing. So basically building off of some of the seeds of the tool that's already in there to make it a little bit more generative and a little bit more robust. Um, the AI chatbot in the service hub is going to continue to improve um, conversation summaries, email summaries on the sales side, automatic data cleanup, sales forecasts, sales talking points, CRM associations, all of that kind of wonderful stuff. So where that cuts down on a lot is, and I don't know if those of you in HubSpot have some of these set up, but some of those internal workflows that we set up to copy data from point A to point B and operate in the background so that salespeople aren't doing that manually, some of that will be baked right into the CRM moving forward. So that's pretty cool. And then ChatSpot, which will help with accelerated sales prospecting, integrated content generation, SEO analysis, company ins insights, and help integrate with the CRM. So that is all upcoming. And as I mentioned, those links that I dropped have a little bit more detail on all of this. Um, and it also features places where you can access a demo. So if you don't have um, all of the hubs and you want to see what this would look like, that those are some really great resources to explore further. Um, okay, so looking into what some of this actually looks like in live time. So the content assistant in email um, looks like this, and you can integrate this rate right with your inbox, whether you have Outlook or Gmail or whatever you may be using, you can integrate it um, and help you generate content. So these are just some examples of the prompts that it gives you. So what type of email are you trying to send? What are you selling? Who are you selling to? In a few words, describe what you want to communicate and what tone would you like? And then you can generate that email. So this is a quicker way to generate some of those touch points than using ChatGPT um, and potentially better. <laughs> that was, that's um, kind of up to you as you toy with it and see what yields better results. But this is native right in HubSpot, which is pretty cool. Um, the conversational intelligence. Um, is able to listen to your calls and then offer you call review if you have that integrated in HubSpot. So that is pretty awesome as well. This is probably better seen than described. So again, if this catches your eye, um, looking into some of the HubSpot resources I sent and seeing this in action is pretty cool. But this is a pretty incredible way to help save salespeople's salespeople time um, and analyze calls and understand what's been said, creating notes and all of that kind of stuff. And then in the conversations inbox, so writing those different um, touch points and things, this is very similar to what Grammarly does across multiple platforms, but again, right in HubSpot. So you're able to write things, change the tone, expand, shorten, all of that kind of stuff. Um, when you are generating text, it can work with that and help you punch things up and make it a little better. Again, this is an awesome way to keep that humanity we talked about earlier, but gain that efficiency instead of toiling over synonyms and did I say the right thing? Am I coming across a certain way? It's right in there to help you out. And reporting. This is really, really, really cool. So in the custom reporting tool, um, I don't know if any of you have had any experience being like, okay, I just need to figure out how to configure all of these millions of different data points and dashboards to just answer this one question that I have. Now you can just type that one question right in and describe the type of report you want and HubSpot will help you get started. So this example says, how much enclosed revenue was won this quarter by each sales rep generate. And then it also gives you some examples down here of the types of reports that you could generate in that style to show you the types of questions you can ask and how to work with the tool. But I think this is awesome because as HubSpot's reporting tools have become more robust, um, at least in my opinion, that's also added certain layers of complications, which means there's awesome data and there's so much there, but it also can be kind of complicated and confusing to work with. So this is a great first step to generate reports that you want to see. Um, as well as in the sales enablement tools, so in the sequence tools, um, there are lots of different um, just integrations with AI there. I was trying to think of a better synonym, but there really isn't one. So you can automatically send emails, get task reminders. You can set task reminders to make a call. Um, and you can use the conversations tool that we just saw to help you with the touch points that you put into your sales enablement, which is, again, just really awesome and helps make people more efficient. 
These are some AI sales tools that integrate with HubSpot that help with some of these specific things. So if you're really looking to maximize the sales team's efficiency, so there is stuff specific to LinkedIn outreach, email outreach, um, personalization and things like that. And this is a link to where you can find these sales tools and test them out. Um, I think that experimenting with some of the LinkedIn outreach stuff could be really cool because currently, in my opinion, that's a little bit of a limitation in HubSpot. Um, so that might be an area that you might want to explore. Okay, so these are some cautions. Um, you still need a human element. AI content can be spotted from a mile away, just like we talked about on the marketing side, all of those synonyms, all of that nothing burger, that can also be true on the sales side. So making sure that when you're sending emails and you're generating it, you're stopping and thinking, okay, does this have value? Does this have the human element? Element? Does this have the touch that I want it to have? Or am I just caught up in how quickly I'm able to get this type of stuff out the door? So really doing those gut checks and checking in on the quality and the human element and making sure that we're not just like generating crap that's just gonna get deleted in someone's inbox. And then similar to the marketing side, AI isn't always right. So if you're asking it to generate anything fact-based and it will take proprietary information and do what it wants with it, again, because HubSpot is a private AI, um, allegedly it does not take your data it does not use it in that way but as i said earlier just a word of caution with super proprietary information maybe just holding that a little close to the vest and not um making sure that ai can't use it to train its models okay this is an ai generated image um to signify that it's time for q a i thought what was interesting about this is it's very anonymous looking it's completely blacked out um the presenters faces, um, I guess, to avoid them looking too wonky, as we know can happen with AI images. So do you guys have any questions? I know this was a lot. Um, I threw a lot at you in this hour. But is there anything you would like to talk about, brainstorm, roundtable, anything like that? Okay. Awesome. Well, I know this was a lot as referenced. Um, so if there's anything that you would like to explore further, uh, if you would like some AI training or some deeper dives um, specific in like a one on one setting for you and your company, you can reach out to Josh or myself and we would be more than happy to brainstorm all of this for you to demo some of the HubSpot tools and talk about um, any of that. But otherwise, thank you guys for attending. I really hope that this was helpful. And um, I hope that AI helps uh, make you more efficient in your journeys. Thank you, Holly. Thank you.